All right, so this week, we're starting a new series, a series that we're calling No Outsiders, where we're going to be talking about the good, how the good news of Jesus is for absolutely everybody. That when it comes to God's kingdom, that there are no outsiders, that you don't have to be born into the right family, you don't have to be perfect, you don't have to have your act together, that when it comes to Jesus, when it comes to the kingdom of God, there are no outsiders whatsoever. Because come on now, let's be honest, it's no fun being an outsider, is it? How many of you have ever been there? You ever had that moment where you felt like an outsider? Isn't that awkward? I mean, come on now, that's just an awkward feeling. It's an awkward moment. And I think all of us have been there, haven't we? We've all had that moment when we just felt like an outsider. I know for me, that was kind of like my entire high school experience. And I know every kid says that, right? Every kid's like, oh, I was an outsider. It's, It's funny, that was always the popular kids that said that. But I'm telling you, man, I had like the worst outsider experience. And the reason it was so bad is because when I went from middle school to high school, check this out, I didn't just go from middle school to high school. I went from a public middle school to a private high school. You see, the problem was, is my my school had a lot of trouble with uh, just uh, violence and fighting and weapons and those sort of things. And so my parents said, you know what? We probably need to make a change. And so I went from a public middle school to a private high school. And the thing you need to know about private schools, they're pretty small, right? And in fact, just to give you an idea, I graduated in 1997. And in 1997, we had 97 kids in our graduating class, which is small, isn't it? Now, the good news is that graduation was quick. I mean, we knocked that bad boy out in no time. But the problem was, is coming into that moment, coming into that situation, all like the social friendships We're already established. How many of you have ever been in that moment where you're the new person coming in to like establish friendships, right? It's hard, isn't it? It's hard to break through because it's almost like there's this barrier there, right? It's like there's a bubble. And even though the other person is just right there, you can literally shake their hand. It's almost like there's this barrier that's separating us from them. And the problem is, is once you're on the outside of that barrier, it feels almost impossible to break through. And unfortunately, this isn't just a high school thing, is it? That we feel this all the time. For some of you, you feel that at work. You start a new job and you feel like this outsider that everybody has those friendships. They've got their inside jokes and so they say something and everybody's laughing and you're just kind of like, <laughs> like that, that kind of awkward laugh. Sometimes that even happens in church, doesn't it? And in fact, how many of you are here today and you've had that awkward moment at church? You've been to a church and you've tried out a church and you felt like an outsider. You felt like you were just on the outside of the looking glass looking in. And it's not like we mean to, right? It's not like we mean to, but the reality is is that church can be a little bit like high school. That we all have our groups. We all have our people that we tend to gravitate towards. And again, we don't mean to. It's human behavior, right? It's human nature. We come in and we naturally want to gravitate towards the people that we're familiar with. And so we go over, we hang out, we say good morning, and then we sit with them. And then people like me stand up and say, hey, turn to your neighbor and say hello. And you're like, hello, neighbor. It's the same people that you just said hi to. And then after worship, you say goodbye to the people next to you. And then we head next door to the third bay where we're going to have lunch. And you sit with the people that you're familiar with. And again, we don't mean to do this, do we? It's natural. It's human nature. We gravitate towards what is familiar. But when we do this, again, whether we mean to or not, we create this barrier, this bubble around us that unintentionally as it may be, we create outsiders. Now, sometimes, sometimes we're also bad at making ourselves outsiders. How many of you have ever had that church experience or even that, that just group experience where you come in right on time, you kind of go by yourself, you put your head down, you don't want to make eye contact with everybody. You get through and then like right when it's over, you head on out the door, right? Is anybody kind of that introvert where you're just kind of wanting to keep to yourself? Right? We unintentionally put this bubble around ourselves. Uh, Sometimes, sometimes the reason we isolate ourselves 
is because we don't feel good enough. Do you ever look at a group of people and say, man, I would love to hang out with them, but you know, if they knew me, if they knew what I was like, if they knew my problems and the skeletons in my closet, I would just run them off. That they would make me an outsider right away. And so rather than risking it, rather than kind of putting myself out there, I'm just gonna keep everybody at arm's distance. See, the problem is in church world, we are really, really bad at making outsiders. And again, the problem is, is once you're on the outside, once you're, once you're outside that bubble, it's really hard, isn't it, to break through to the other side, which is what I love about Jesus. Because as we look at the scriptures, as we look at the story of Jesus time and time and time again, what we see is that he goes to the outsiders. It's almost like he gravitates towards them, isn't it? That he's always going to the outsiders. He grabs his arms around them and brings them in to be insiders. And what we need to understand is that just like in our culture, this first century world had a real big problem creating outsiders. And in fact, I think it was worse for them than it was for us. And the reason I say that is, come on, man. We live in a culture where you got churches all over the place, right? I mean, come on. If you don't like one church, you can go down the street, try another church. If you don't like that church, you can go around the corner and find another church. You can just kind of bounce around and shop around. That we live in a culture where churches are everywhere. And in fact, I love this story. Um, back when we were in Virginia, now understand, like Virginia's the South, okay? I know us as Midwesterners, we don't get this. We look at the map and we're like, that's kind of in the middle. That's not really the, North, the South. No, it's the South. And if you go there and say otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. I'm just saying. It's the South, and because it's the South, you've got churches all over the place. In fact, check this out. Just down the street from our house, there was these two churches, I'm not kidding you, they shared a driveway. Literally, you could turn into the driveway, and if you didn't like one church, you could walk across the parking lot and get to another church. You see, in our culture, if you don't like a certain church, you've got plenty of options. And you can just kind of look around until you find one that fits. But in their culture, in the first century world, they didn't have a lot of churches. They had the temple. They had the priests. And that was it. And if you were an outsider, you were an outsider. And there was no way that you were going to get back in. Which, again, is what I love about Jesus. Because time and time again, Jesus just goes to the outsiders. He goes to the fringe, he goes to the disenfranchised, he goes to the outcasts, and he brings them back in because the kingdom of God isn't just for some people, it's for everybody, no matter how broken, no matter how lost, no matter how hurt we are, that the invitation for Jesus is for everybody. And so what we're gonna be doing throughout this series is just looking at several stories where we see how Jesus is gonna go to the outsiders and bring them in. And so uh, if you got your Bible today, do me a big favor. Turn with me to the book of John in chapter 8. We're going to be in John chapter 8. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we should have Bibles in the chairs in front of you. If you've got one of those, we're going to be on page 894. Today it's 894. And while you're turning there, just kind of a quick background on what's going on so that we kind of understand the situation here. Jesus is in Jerusalem. And the reason he's in Jerusalem is because it's the feast of, oh goodness, my mind just went blank. Would you look at that? Uh, it is the feast of Sukkot. Now, Sukkot is one of the three major feasts of Israel that required a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which means if you were living somewhere else during one of these three feasts, you've got Sukkot, Shavuot, and of course, Passover. If you lived out of town for one of those three feasts, you were required to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. And so understand that this story takes place in Jerusalem during like one of the busiest times of the year. It's like going to the mall at Christmas, right? I mean, everybody is there. This place is packed. And so with that kind of said, look at what it says in John 8. We're going to begin in verse 2. It says, early in the morning, he came again to the temple. And all the people came with him. 
and he sat down and taught them. And so he's at the temple and he's getting ready to teach and everybody is there. Everybody wants to hear him because remember, Jesus is no ordinary rabbi. Jesus was a rabbi with authority. And one of the things that we need to understand about rabbis with authority is that they were extremely rare. If you've been with us before, you've heard me say this, that in the hundred years around the ministry of Jesus, there were maybe 12 of these guys. And so everybody wants to hear him. He's in, like, everybody's in town, we're there, he's there at the same time, and so I want to go and hear him speak. And so everybody's there, and with that said, look at what happens. Verse 3. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placed her in their midst. Now, before we get into it too much, I want you to notice the words scribe and Pharisee. You see, the problem I think we have with these two titles is that when we hear scribe or we hear Pharisee, what we want to do is say, oh, these are like the Democrats and Republicans of their world, don't we? That for some reason, we look at this and say, oh, these must be like the political powers. And so what happens when we read this story, we want to read this as if it, this is some big political agenda, right? With all of the power, all of the resources, all of the energy that was backing it. As if what's happening here is this big political conspiracy. And what we need to understand is that's not exactly what's happening here. You see, the interesting thing about the word scribe or Pharisee is that these were really, really, really broad labels, okay? And so under the term scribe or under the term Pharisee, you had people with all kinds of different beliefs, everything from what they would have considered to be the far left to what they would have considered to be the far right. Now, uh, I'm not going to get into this too much, but... In their world, far left and far, far right was really different than what we consider far left and far right. We live in a culture of polars, don't we? We live in a culture where we're constantly pushing the edges further and further. Theirs was a lot more central than what we're used to. But again, under the umbrella of scribe and under the umbrella of Pharisee, you had all kinds of different beliefs. And so rather than hearing scribe and Pharisee and thinking like Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or Green Party, I'm really trying to cover all the bases here. Rather than thinking about those ideas, think about the word politician. Because politician's a big word, right? Under the word politician, you have Democrat, Republican, Green, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything fits under that umbrella. And so what we have here happening in this story is not this big political conspiracy where these, these big organizations trying to undermine Jesus. What is probably happening here, very realistically, is you've got a group of scribes and a group of Pharisees, maybe no more than five, who have kind of gotten together and maybe they don't like Jesus. Maybe they don't like some of the things that he's teaching. Maybe they're jealous. After all, Jesus has this huge crowd of people. Maybe they were standing over here like, Where, where's my crowd, right? Maybe they were jealous of him. I don't know. But they get together and they kind of hatch this plan to try to undermine Jesus. And so they bring this woman in front of everybody and they accuse her of adultery. Now, as we go through this story, there's a couple of things that are going to happen that kind of cue us into the fact that something's wrong here, right? Like these guys are doing something that they shouldn't do. This is a little bit shady, right? You, you with me? There's a couple of things that we see that kind of cue us into this. And the first one is right here. I want you to notice that only the woman is brought forward, isn't she? Where's the guy? Like he's nowhere to be found, is he? Now, what we want to say is, well, that's just their world. That they lived in a very male-dominated world, and so of course they're only going to bring the woman up. That the man kind of gets away scot-free, because that was just their world, and that's the way it was. And the problem is, that wasn't the way it was in their world. And in fact, according to Deuteronomy 22.22, 22, I love that one because it's easy to remember, According to Deuteronomy 22, 22, in order to have a fair trial, in order to have a legit trial, you had to have both 
people present because, you know, part, pardon the phrase, it takes two to tango, right? Like you had to have both people there. But she's the only one there, which tells us that something is wrong here. And what makes this such a big deal is that she's being accused of adultery. Now, here in a minute, we're going to see that the punishment for adultery is very serious. That the punishment of adultery is, is like nothing to look over. That the punishment of adultery is death by stoning. Now, realistically, just because she's found guilty of adultery doesn't mean they're actually going to stone her. Because it's one thing to accuse somebody and find somebody guilty. It's a whole other thing to actually pick up stones and throw them at people, isn't it? Like, that's quite a leap. But check this out. Even if she's not found guilty of adultery, there are all kinds of implications that that carries with her. Because just like in our world, adultery is a very serious label. And don't get me wrong, it's a big label in our world, isn't it? I mean, let's be honest. If, if you call somebody an adulterer, is there part of you that kind of like wants to take a little bit of a step back? Like we get a little bit weary about people who are accused of adultery. And that's our culture. In the mm, excuse me, in the 21st century. This is the first century world. And there are massive consequences for anybody who is caught in adultery. First of all, this woman would have acquired shame. And in a culture of honor and shame, shame was worse than death. In fact, death was preferable. Have you ever watched like an old samurai movie where the samurai like occurs shame, he pulls out a sword and stabs himself? We're like, that's weird. That's their culture. Now, that doesn't mean people just go around killing themselves, but that's the extreme to which they saw shame. Now, Check this out, because she would have occurred shame because of the act of adultery, her family would have likely, not necessarily, but likely would have disowned her. This would have been a way of distancing themselves from her so that they could regain a little bit of their honor. And remember, this is a male-dominated world where the men were the providers for the family. The men were, were the ones who worked. Women couldn't just go out and get a job. If she has no family, and let's be honest, she's not married at that point, who's going to take care of her? Who's going to provide for her? Where's she going to get food? Do you see what's happening here? That this group of scribes and Pharisees are trying to make this woman an outsider, an outcast, for the sake of trying to make an example out of Jesus they are using her as a pawn to push their own political agenda. Once she's labeled an adulterer, I can tell you one thing. She's probably not going to get married because with that label, and you know, you know this, labels carry weight, don't they? Where Labels carry all this other stuff. She would have seen herself as unlovable, unworthy. She would have seen herself as never going to amount to anything. Don't miss this. The fact that they accuse her of adultery is a very, very, very serious thing. And so they bring her up in the middle of everybody, the whole crowd watching, and they accuse her of adultery. Verse four, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? Verse 6, they said this to test him that they might have a charge to bring against him. Quick thing about testing in the first century world, because if you go through your Bible and you look at the story of Jesus, you're going to see that people test him all the time, right? And what we want to do is assume that testing is bad, right? Especially because of stories like this. It just seems bad. Testing wasn't always bad. Testing, very simply, was a way of finding out what that rabbi believed, just like if you're here today and you're a guest and you want to know more about us, I'm willing to bet you're testing us right now. Before you came, you might have even gone to our website and looked around. The reason you did that is because you were testing us. You just want to know what we're about and what we believe, what we don't believe on this and that. You're just trying to figure out who we are. That is testing. Testing in itself is not a bad thing. But what makes it so bad in this case is the heart. 
Notice again where it says, they said this to test him that they might have a charge to bring against him. They're intentionally trying to undermine him. They're intentionally trying to trap him. And with that said, look at the way that Jesus responds. I love this. This is, in fact, this is my favorite response of Jesus in the whole Bible. Look at this. It says this, he bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. And as they continued to ask him questions, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. So they're accusing her of adultery. I love this because Jesus doesn't say anything. He just like gets down in the dirt and starts playing, right? He starts writing in the ground. They keep asking him questions. He stands up and says, okay, you, if you don't have sin, go ahead, be my guest, throw a stone. And then he starts writing again. And then after that, everybody starts leaving. Now, the question that we want to ask is what? What did he write on the ground? Exactly. Because that's what we want to know. Obviously, writing on the ground was the catalyst, wasn't it? That Jesus wrote on the ground, says some words, writes on the ground again, people leave. So obviously what he wrote on the ground is important, but the Bible doesn't tell us. And the reason it doesn't tell us is because what he wrote wasn't the point. See, the question that we need to ask isn't what he wrote on the ground, it's why he wrote on the ground. Now to help us answer this one, uh, I, I gotta teach you a little something about rabbis. You see, Whenever the rabbi was asked a question about the Bible, he would always, always, always answer by quoting the Bible. Always. And so Jesus was asked a question about the Bible. Law of Moses says this, what do you say? Jesus answers by referring to the Bible. You see, Jesus is going to use a rabbinic teaching technique known as remaz. Now, Remaz is my absolute favorite teaching technique because basically it's a movie quote. Does anybody here speak movie quote? I'm fluent. Our house is very fluent. We speak movie quotes to each other all the time. And so if I was making a movie quote or a movie reference, I might say something like this. Do or do not. There is no try. Anybody get that one? Awesome. There we go. How about this one? Ma chérie, mademoiselle, it is with deepest pride and greatest pleasure that I welcome you here tonight. Now let me allow you, uh, invite you to relax. Let us pull up a chair as the dining room proudly presents your dinner. Anybody get that? Awesome. Did anybody not get either of those? Uh, what if I said elementary, my dear Watson? Anybody get that? If anybody's left out, I would say that's inconceivable. Right, that's a reference. Now notice, I, I didn't necessarily quote the movie, right? Because if you're gonna use a movie reference, you're gonna, just gonna say, do or do not. There is no try. I'm not gonna say, by the way, that was Yoda, Empire Strikes Back, everybody got that? I mean, if they get it, they get it, but if you don't get it, you just kind of move on, right? Because that's the way that we use movie references. And the rabbis would actually do the same thing when it came to teaching the Bible. Only instead of quoting movies, they would reference the Bible. Remember, this is a world before Star Wars. Can you imagine? A world before Disney. A world before all that entertainment. That, that all they had was this. And remember, he's speaking to scribes and Pharisees. These are people who would have had the Bible memorized by heart. And so often the rabbis would give a word, a phrase, or an example, a demonstration, as a way of referencing a verse or, or a section in the Bible. And so when Jesus starts to write on the ground, the question they're thinking isn't, what is he writing? The question they're wrestling with is, where in the Bible does it talk about being written in the dust? Check this one out. Jeremiah 17, 13. 
By the way, Jeremiah 17 is loaded with great imagery. Uh, in November, we're going to do an entire sermon on Je uh, Jeremiah 17 and some of the images there. But look at this, Jeremiah 17, 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you, by the way, before we go on, what does it mean, if you were to use a word to describe it, what does it mean to forsake or to turn away from God? What is that? That's sin, right? I mean, when we sin, we turn away from God. When we sin, we forsake God. So understand, he's talking about sin here. He says this, all who forsake your name shall be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust. Some of your Bibles will translate that earth in Hebrew, that's the same. For they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. What did Jesus just say here? These guys bring this woman up to stone her. Say, you know, the law says that we should kill a person like this. What do you say? Jesus begins to play in the dirt. Referencing this verse, all who sin against God are written in the dust. He stands up and says, all right, fine. You, without sin, throw the first stone. And then he writes again. And one by one, they get it. And they leave, beginning with the oldest. Because the younger ones are just following the leader, right? That one by one, they leave until it's just Jesus and the woman. It's amazing, the teaching style of Jesus Rabbis with authority were known as master teachers. This is why. Jesus cleaned out a room of scholars by playing in the dirt and saying a few words. That any one of us with sin in our life is just as bad. Again, the good news is there are no outsiders. We're all in the same boat because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so Jesus is left alone with the woman Notice this last part. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where, where are they? Has no one condemned you? I mean, I thought we were doing a thing here, guys. Everyone left. She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. But then he says this. And from now on, sin no more. See, I love this because Jesus doesn't just kind of keep her safe during this moment. But what Jesus is doing here is calling her to live a life of more. He's calling her to live a higher standard. He's calling her to live a life of intention and purpose. See, the problem is we live in a culture where the way that we welcome outsiders is to just kind of brush aside any of the things that they're doing wrong. It's not a big deal. That's not really that bad. That you just, you just keep doing that. But the problem is, if somebody's doing something that is genuinely destructive, don't you want them to stop? I mean, if somebody was doing something like cutting themselves, you would want them to stop, wouldn't you? Or if somebody was, let's say, an adulterer like this. Adultery is an action that causes a lot of destruction, right? It is like a bomb that blows up in the middle of a relationship and it affects so many more people than we realize. You see, this is the thing with sin that we never talk about in church world. We always talk about that sin is bad, but we never explain why. The problem with sin is that sin is destructive. That sin is going to keep you from the life that God is calling you to live. It is going to tear you down. And the problem is it's not always big, is it? You see, some sin is big and you recognize it right away. Like murder. Like if you murder somebody, that's a pretty obvious one. Or even adultery. You can understand the, the ramifications and the consequences of that. But the problem is, is that some of our sin is so small, it's so little, that we don't even realize it's hurting us. And in fact, we've convinced ourselves that it's not that big a deal because we're not seeing the consequences. We're not seeing the effects of it in our life. And the problem is, is that that sin is still destructive. It's just slowly eroding us away. It's stealing 
your life. Bit by bit, it's tearing you down. Jesus looks at the woman and says, oh, sin no more. You were called to be so much more than this. Jesus looks at this woman and sees potential worth and value. But she has to step into that. And the way that she does that is by leaving that life of sin and following Jesus. And so the question I want to ask as we wrap up is what is the junk in our life that we need to let go of? What is the sin that's holding you back? I mean, maybe for you it's the big stuff and you know it's wrong. Like you know that you shouldn't do it, but I can't help myself. And so maybe for you it's something big, but maybe for you it's something smaller. It's something you feel like you're getting away with every single time that you do it that nobody else knows. But again, the problem is it's slowly stealing your life. It's almost like the FBI watching and building a case against you. You don't realize that it's happening, and so you just kind of keep going. But eventually, eventually your junk catches up with you. You see, the way that we move from being outsiders to insiders, the way that we begin to follow Jesus is through obedience. It's by slowly learning to let go of the sin that holds us back. But the good news of Jesus is that he doesn't wait for us to be perfect before he welcomes us in. Because he loves us just as we are, flawed, broken. The good news of Jesus is that he comes to us no matter how broken we are, no matter how badly we've messed up. And in fact, here in just a moment, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. We've got stations uh, all around. We've got gluten-free in the back. And during this time, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus, that Jesus came here to die for us, to set us free. Free from our sin, free from the junk that's holding us back, so that we could live what he calls in John 10.10, 10, abundant life. And so during this time, let's just take some time and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And during this time, let's just start asking God, Okay, honestly, what are the things that we need to let go of? What are the things that we need to say no to in our life so that we could live that life abundant, so that we could step into the life we were created to live? Let me pray for us. God, we thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for your grace and your love. We thank you for your mercy the mercy we see here in this story where Jesus, where Jesus rescues this woman who's being accused of a crime and the consequences that go with it. They were making her an outsider and you pull her back in. God, I thank you that Jesus offers the same for us. God, I thank you that Jesus died for our sins so that we could be set free from all of that baggage and all of that stuff that's holding us back. God, I, I just pray that you would give us eyes to see what needs to change in our life and the courage to put it down so that we could trust you, so that we could follow you. God, thank you for this opportunity today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.